good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us here uh, at CSIS. I'm Todd Harrison. Uh, I'm the Director of Defense Budget Analysis and a Senior Fellow here in the International Security Program at CSIS. It's my pleasure this morning uh, to uh, introduce uh, this esteemed uh, group of uh, panelists here. Uh, I'll start uh, immediately to my left is Tom Carrico. Uh, he is a director of the Missile Defense Project here at CSIS and a senior fellow in ISP. Uh, and he is the author of the new report that's being released today. Uh, it's a great report. Uh, it's up on our website. I urge everyone uh, to go download a copy and take a look. Uh, and he will be presenting uh, some of the findings from his report uh, this morning. Uh, then I also want to introduce next to Tom uh, is Major General Knudsen, uh, Deputy Director of the Missile Defense Agency, uh, and he is no uh, newcomer to missile defense. Uh, he also previously served uh, in MDA as the Program Executive for Programs and Integration. And to his left uh, is Lieutenant General Retired Trey Obering. Uh, he is currently Executive Vice President at Booz Allen Hamilton, uh, where, among other things, uh, he helps direct work uh, with clients regarding directed energy. Uh, and he also uh, previously served as Director of the Missile Defense Agency. Uh, so it is my pleasure to turn it over to my colleague Tom Carrico to begin the briefing. Well, thank you, Todd, uh, for moderating, and thank you, General Knudsen and General uh, Obering. So, delighted to be uh, to rolling out the study uh, today. In one sense, this is about MDA budget trends, uh, but in another sense, it's really about the identity uh, of the agency and, and kind of how we, in a, in a whole of government uh, sense, approach the missile defense mission more broadly. And I want to recognize especially my colleagues uh, at CSIS, Ian Williams and Wes Rumbaugh, for their uh, extensive research and contributions to this study uh, as well. And I also want to thank all the many people around town who let me bend their ear over the past year uh, about this uh, and help, help us understand all the many things that make MDA unique and a delightfully complex object of analysis. So the idea about this report came about from talking to folks, uh, including some past MDA officials who came to me and said, Tom, don't just follow the money, follow the color of money. If you really want to understand what's happening with MDA and what's, uh, what's going on. And so we, we did that and we started digging. Um, and what we kind of found is that here we are in the middle of the, the third offset, uh, but there is some uh, declining attention, some declining focus uh, on uh, RDT and E, but also more specifically uh, on R and D. So we're intrigued by that. Went, and try to get as much data as we could and try to make sense of it. Uh, and this is kind of what we, uh, what we came up with. So let me set the scene uh, and explain the title uh, a little bit. Uh, over the past 15 years, missile defense has gone from, from infancy to adolescence, uh, from an idea that was largely restricted by treaty uh, to something with initial defensive capabilities and, uh, and something a little bit more now. And MDA, of course, was created in 2002 as a successor to both SDIO and BIMDO, both of which had existed under the treaty regime uh, and had, were it was an, a greater focus of those uh, in part because it was a treaty restriction. Uh, but R&D is also at, and, and has been and continues to be at the, the institutional and conceptual center uh, of the missile defense problem. Uh, and so the special acquisition authorities that MDA had and acquired in 2002 are in some ways the effect, not the cause, of the, of the problem of missile defense. Uh, the constantly evolving threat and the need to, to get after that. Um, when, it, when Reagan launched SDI, its first task was uh, a research and development program. But MDA was a little bit different. It wasn't just supposed to be about R&D. It was self-consciously and deliberately created in the absence of treaty restrictions to go out and field stuff and get it, get it out there to defend the country and defend uh, our forces and friends and allies. Uh, and the idea, when it was stood up, was a kind of division of labor, a, a three-stage process. So things would be developed, there would be a transition to the services, and then the third, more regularized procurement would get out there. Uh, and the services would take that over. Some 14 years later, we're still in the transition phase uh, for things like Aegis, THAAD, and, and perhaps GMD. 
So some important progress has been made. I think there's uh, many differences of opinion about, uh, about the transfer question in particular. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that it has proceeded at a, at a different, at a slower pace than what was envisioned in 2002. And so it's this larger question of, of things beyond R&D, procurement and operations. These are the colors of money that MDA has acquired newly relative to its institutional, uh, its institutional predecessors. And so what we came up with uh, is that along the, the path from infancy to adolescence, MDA had some sort of natural, some natural um, growing pains or birthing pains, as you will. And a couple things really to highlight, that MDA has been hit, over the, especially over the last eight to 10 years, with a significantly reduced top line uh, and in some sense, that explains everything, because with a big enough top line, these other things can go away. But with a reduced top line, the other components here, uh, the relative importance begins to magnify. The second uh, part is the expanded role, taking on that uh, procurement and operations uh, responsibility. And then finally, uh, foreign assistance. And by that, I especially mean uh, foreign assistance on missile defense related to to Israel, and the effect of these three things together has squeezed, in relative terms, but also absolute terms, the RDT and E focus. So let me start in on the, the top line, a third of this. This is the following tree graph. Uh, the first, this is the first element of strain. Between 2007 and 2016, MDA's budget went down to some 23%. Uh, and there were some, some big hits, 2006, 2000, uh, 2010, uh, but overall you see a pretty constant trend here. But notice these are the phi depths. And what you also see in the following tree graph is that there's all these optimistic projections out to the future, but those frequently never come through. And so what happens is you project one thing for next year, and then that doesn't actually get delivered, and that over time tends to have a, a corrosive effect on your ability to plan uh, for these things. And just this is another way of, of measuring it. DO, uh, MDA as a percentage of DOD uh, is, also, is also down from 2, 2.3 down to, uh, uh, to just under uh, 1.5. And here is a snapshot of, of the decline on particular programs, the procurement and the RDT&E for green, that's GMD. The Aegis is red and THAD, uh, THAD is blue. Uh, THAD has been the most constant, even though uh, we, I think I have four operational THAD batteries today. We're on track to seven, maybe eight within the FIDEP. Still not sure where the ninth one uh, is gonna come, gonna come through. And here's really the, the expanded role. This is, this is really the addition of those colors of money. And this is, in a way, I would say the central graph that explains what's going on uh, with, with MDA. Now, I'll just point out over here on this side, you look at, 2004, 2005, 6, 7, the blue in this is RDT&E. It's all blue, right? That doesn't mean that MDA was doing all research and development, just the opposite. For those years, MDA was taking advantage, of course, of its special acquisition authority to the hilt. Uh, everything was in the RDT&E account, even though in those years, substantial capital investments, uh, Milcon-like and procurement-like investments for Fort Greeley and lots of other places to get things in the ground uh, very quickly. Now, we weren't able to break that down uh, precisely. That data is not forthcoming because from a technical perspective, it's all RDT&E. But suffice to say that if you come at it from a, a contract's point of view, it is a lot of, a lot of red, a lot of procurement activities uh, uh, going on. Now, now we're gonna break this down a little bit more individually. This is the procurement trend. Now, let me go, go back to this real quick. The red, the procurement, only really begins to show up in 2009. That's because Congress said, okay, we're gonna tighten up your, your flexibility on uh, put it, keeping everything in our RDT&E, and we're gonna f force you to put some things over to the, the uh, procurement account as such. And so that's where it begins to show up again as it had been uh, back in the, the BMDO days, or the, just after the BMDO days. So the red there is, is procurement. Let me break that down here. Uh, here you see from 2009 out through the FIDEP, through 2020, 2021, 
a pretty substantial increase. And you're looking at 23% or so of MDA's budget being dedicated to procurement at the end of the next five years. Likewise with O&M, uh, you see a pretty, uh, I think, constant uh, trend upward. Uh, blue in this case is, uh, is THAAD, red is Aegis, uh, and green is uh, TP2 radars, and GMD is, is at the bottom. Uh, this is going to go up. Now, I will say one thing about this graph. Uh, through the FIDEP, 17 to 21, uh, the rate of O&M growth here is 3% after inflation. And that, incidentally, as I've learned from my colleague Todd, is historically the average growth rate for O&M for, for, for systems generally that you have today. So you've got to budget just that. The difficulty, however, and then I would, I would raise the question of whether that is uh, perhaps a little bit too rosy of an estimate, is that over the next couple years within the FIDEP, GMD is going to be adding, GMD is going to be nearly doubling the number of its uh, GBIs in the ground. We're going to get a lot more THAAD and Aegis, things like that. So I wouldn't be surprised if O&M ends up eating up a greater percentage than even the 6%, 7% uh, projected here. A final component here uh, that I think really doesn't get uh, much attention, it's one of the things that people don't like to talk about, is uh, foreign assistance to Israel. Um, this is one of the longest standing uh, and a, a very important and a close relationship that the United States has with Israel missile defense cooperation, Japan and NATO perhaps being rivals in terms of the, 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 uh, the, the, the importance there. Um, but, but this there's also a trend here that I think really needs to be highlighted to understand. When you're talking about 9% of MDA's budget being occupied by foreign assistance for both buying interceptors and research and development, that starts to add up to real money. 23% for procurement, 6-7% for O&M, 9% for, uh, for Israel. This starts to add up. And it's, again, the combination of these things that are putting, uh, putting a squeeze on. Uh, uh, this, is, this is just the real numbers. The blue is the, the RDT&E and the, the, the red is the procurement. But this, this graph, I think, explains it uh, perhaps better. That year in and year out, what tends to happen is that Congress will take a look at the administration's requested amount for Israel, and they'll add some amount uh, in addition to that. But what happens in the process is that MDA is not really fully made whole in the process. And so year in and year out, what tends to happen is that U.S. programs tend to get cut as a kind of bill payer for a larger uh, Israel program. I think everybody kind of knows that, uh, although it's not really, uh, not really accepted. In this graph, the orange, that's the delta of wh whether MDA got plus upped or cut. The blue is the amount that was requested for Israel by the president, and the green is the amount that Israel got that year. And very frequently, uh, MDA's delta uh, of increase, or in some cases decrease, is nowhere near enough to, to cover that. And so these several trends, declining top line, increase, or these, these other colors of money, as it were, O&M, uh, procurement, and foreign assistance, these all combine to put a squeeze on RDT&E, and more specifically, research and development. So here's kind of the formal RDT&E graph. The percentile on the red above, and then the, uh, the real dollars uh, below. And I think you really see a pretty, uh, pretty undeniable uh, trend downward. Now, half of this, part of this is explained, of course, by the appearance in 2009 of the requirement to reclassify certain things as really what they are, as procurement, uh, as O&M, as opposed to having procurement-like activities in this account. So, that, so you really don't understand the story from this graph alone because it's hard to know what within the, the bulk of MDA's budget in RDT&E is really kind of designed to be outpacing the threat, those technological investments to truly outpace the threat. And so you gotta dig a little deeper. And this is the budget activities within the RDT&E graph. That orange is the uh, vast majority, and that's budget activity four. And that's really the most mature part, right? The kind of the evaluation of more mature technologies and basically the vast majority of what MDA does is in that budget activity category. And so you'll have, for instance, SBX operations, pretty obviously defined as operations in that category. And if you take a look at that little strip of blue, 
That's budget activity three, right? And here you see over the past uh, 10, uh, 20 years, this has gone from about just over uh, 450 million down to about 150 million in the, over the course of the FIDEP. And this is, you know, less advanced, or might, might be more advanced technology programs, uh, but, but less mature, right? And so here I think is where you begin to really get at the decline, not out of the rdt &E account, but of the research and development uh, side of things. We're just not doing as much of that new stuff, that sort of advanced technology kind of thing. And I'll, I'll just highlight the FY 2017 uh, appropriations process, for instance. The appropriators in um, the House and the Senate, I believe, cut some of the, the most important uh, advanced technology work that MDA is doing in terms of RKV, in terms of a next generation booster, in terms of directed energy, in terms of an, a multiple object kill vehicle, all those got cut so as to pay for uh, Israeli uh, missile defense foreign assistance. Okay, so what does all this mean? How does this all congeal together? What are the possible paths forward? Well, I see basically three things. MDA can accept this trend, this re retention really of procurement, this retention of operations uh, and sustainment as opposed to pushing it out to the services who may after all not really want it and may not uh, steward it. It might evolve, MDA might evolve into something like uh, a combat support agency, right? Some folks have suggested here, for instance, that maybe there ought to be something like a BMD command even. Uh, that's, that's one possibility. The second possibility is really the opposite of that that MDA ought to go back to basics, right? And really f transfer out that, that procurement responsibility, transfer out the operations to the services, let them take it, and if they want to kill it, kill it. But MDA is kind of the DARPA of missile defense to retain its BIMDO-like focus uh, on uh, advancing uh, those things. And the third possibility is you, you could have some combination of those, uh, or you could really uh, kind of be muddling through, I think, uh, Failing to get at this problem, failing to, as, uh, as, as as Carter has warned, failure to preserve your seed corn and eating your seed corn instead, uh, that's, uh, that's a third option. So I'll leave it there, and I look forward to uh, the discussion. Thank you, Tom. Um, <clears throat> so now we want to uh, open it up to our panelists uh, for discussion. And so I'll start with uh, General Knudsen uh, and give you a few minutes uh, to respond. Uh, and then uh, we'll go to General Obering next. And then after that, we're going to open it up to Q&A from the audience. So General Knudsen. OK, well, as, as it goes on in the debate, sometimes the facts are the facts. So there's, so there's no doubt about the numbers are what they are. We have charts that look very similar to the charts Tom has just presented. Um, and so I think one of the things that we ought to all be conscious of as we go forward is have these, I don't know, I'll call it visualizations of what's happening as it's going on and as opposed to kind of after the fact, because I'm not entirely sure everybody's been tracking this as, it, as this transition happened as much as what it is. So, so I think calling a light to this is a good thing. Um, and, and certainly the top line reductions that MDA has taken are what they are. They also are pretty much in line with what the department has taken overall. So if you go look at the services and everybody, I, they aren't exactly pretty much, that, that trend is there. So, um, and, and we all kind of know how that happened with caps that have been on from various things that are going on at the national debate on how much money is in defense. So, so that's part of the challenge that we've taken on. I, I would say as part of that challenge, even though there clearly have been those top line reductions, we've at least done all we think we could to keep on increasing both uh, capability and capacity um, within MDA in light of that. And so I'll just name a few. So we, we continued on doing the things that were set kind of in advance of these overall reductions being put in around the EPA, European phase adaptive approach, um, bringing on uh, the phase two at the end of last year and, and then IOC just recently for the site in Romania and then continuing to um, work towards um, increased 
capability and bring in the 2A missile along with the Poland site to get much more coverage by 2018. Um, so we continued that. And then we also shifted to do some things that weren't in the plan, I guess, even before these cuts happened. And that's around really some of the things that happened were Homeland Defense and the KN08 that emerged in 2012, 2013, and we shifted to putting more GBIs in the ground um, in, our, in our field in Fort Greeley. And then we also have done a few other things which started the Long Range Discriminating Radar Program, LRDR, that um, we're breaking ground soon to um, get that going up in Alaska in the 2020 timeframe that will significantly increase our capability to have discrimination for um, all of uh, CONUS. And, and we're working also to improve our discrimination algorithms, and that may sound a little soft, but, and our, our whole discrimination approach that we've taken, but we've done a lot of work on that. We recently had a very significant test, and at the end of January, we put up a very complex threat scene and ran um, a bunch of scenarios and gathered a lot of data that were uh, reaping benefits. So we've had a bunch of things that we, I'll call it, been working on for years and we use that to validate some of them and then to take it to the next step in other cases. And then we've also um, started the redesign of the, of the kill vehicle for the GMD program for the GBIs, which is really a foundation that we need to have over the next um, at least decade until probably we can bring on hopefully additional technologies. We've continued to try and work some of these aspects of future technology, not as much as maybe we would have hoped or as fast because we sometimes had some reductions of things that we asked for, but we are working on um, directed energy with the goal of getting to a capability of having boost phase kill, which you know allows you to thin the herd um, and and really helps you know not have to discriminate. And we are working on the MOKV. So there's a number of things that we've taken on. I'm not going to say it's been, I'll call it as perfect as maybe we could have been if we didn't have the top line cuts. But the top line cuts are there, and then and then you. There's some other things, and then within the line that um, Tom talked about, about the transition from RDT and E over to more ONS and procurement, and that's certainly factual too. There's no, there's no doubt that that's happened. You explained very well how many of those things have happened. I would just add one more aspect of that that I think is significant. And so, as we brought on several of these systems, and I'll call it that and Aegis and the tippy twos, um, where we're at is their mature capabilities that the warfighters are now depending on. They're not, they're not developmental systems, they're there. Thad is fielded um, five batteries now, soon we'll have seven batteries fielded over the next couple of years. We're at 30-some um, Aegis ships and growing on BMD capability, and, and we've got Tippy twos deployed around the world doing a 365 24-7 BMD mission for the COCOM. So, and the COCOMs have no shortage of demands for current capability. They want, I'll call it more than what we are delivering now. And so what we have is this maturing of things that we brought on that cause us to have to balance, all right, in, in terms of both procuring them after we develop the capability, because that's what the COCOMs want. They want the capability delivered, not just being in development forever. So we start delivering it. And then we also are, are supporting the sustainment of it. So the, the aspect of that then, if you accept that, that what we're doing has delivered things the COCOMs need, um, who pays for it is the other question as we continue to sustain it and then procure more of them. And from, I'll say from the COCOM's perspective, they probably don't care. They just want the capability, whether it comes from MDA or it comes from a service. And so what we've been in um, is discussions with the services of, of transfer. And I'll say over the last year, 
with the Army, we spent a lot of time, I'll call it really wrestling with um, the transfer of THAAD and TIPI-2. And we're making progress. Uh, I would say that when we probably didn't start with this fully flushed out, it was always more of a concept that we're going to transfer as opposed to, okay, where's the, the money that goes with it and all the other, I'll call it mechanics of, um, of the transition actually happening and someone else taking over what someone who started it has. And so they have a lot of questions, all right? And, and so we're working through that process with the Army. Um, and I think we'll get there, but at the end of the day, it does come down to the money. And so when we get to MDA's RDT&E um, percentages reducing, it's a fact. So the solution to that is not necessarily transfer of ONS and procurement over to the services unless it goes without dollars. And so if you're any one of the services, you know, I'm an Army guy and we've been in discussion with them and I know how they feel, but I think the Navy, we've had some discussions with the Navy and, and the Air Force, they, they all are the same. All the services have kind of this reducing top line, I'll call it lots of priorities, um, that they probably can't do all of what they do now. And if you say, well, here's a new mission and MDA is gonna keep the money that was doing it so they can do more of the future, I, I don't know how that turns out because we just, we're, where we're at is it, we're pretty much assuming in order for transfer to happen, um, the money that is programmed for ONS and procurement is going to have to go with it, at least in the near term, um, and from the mechanics of it. And there may be other ways to do that. So, so that's what our challenge is. Our challenge is being able to keep on providing capability to the COCOMs, figuring out how to transfer and be able to tackle the future. And, and it, it's probably not as simplistic as saying, well, just you just do RDT&E in the future and the, and the services do um, ONS and procurement. I, I would say that if we made a very deliberate long-term and stuck to it, we might be able to get there, but you would have to plan this out seven years in advance. And why I say seven years in advance is because we plan five years in the fight up and then we typically work that, that two years in advance. We make the decisions before that. So you'd have to be programming this money for ONS and procurement and it'd still be in kind of a zero sum within the DOD but you'd be saying, all right, to this service, if you if you want more of this capability that the COCOM wants and you're provided, that you gotta start in this year, seven years from now, doing this, and then we gotta stick with it through what will probably be multiple leadership changes and everything and have the rules there. And then it would be, I'll call it easier, maybe. Um, but, every, but every year then as it got closer, because everybody has this problem as you get to the real near years of, all right, I got to deal with problems I didn't see, you know, and, and so now those hard decisions will still have to be made. Um, so I, I applaud Tom for, um, and CSIS for bringing this subject up, and all the facts I think are, are what they are. It's a, it's a challenge I think we've been wrestling through it. I don't know if it's muddled, but maybe, maybe it is from the outside, because that's what it says on the last one, but I, it, it's not an easy one unless, the, the only easy solution is, of course, or easier solution, is to have more top line kind of for everybody. And then this gets easier anyway. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thanks. All right, and uh, so, so no easy answers. <laughs> General Lowbury. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I very much appreciate the opportunity to comment on this. Uh, Tom has laid out a lot of the what, and what I thought I would do and, and is give you some of the why and some of the context behind this, since I'm the old guy up here, and I was at the inception of MDA in 2002. 
Uh, speaking of which, I want to say that uh, in my 35-year career, I never worked with another organization uh, that had as many dedicated, smart, intelligent, and talented people in my life. And what they've been asked to do in the mission they have is a tough mission. And I think they've done an extremely uh, good job at it. And in fact, a lot of what we're talking about here today, uh, in many aspects, is that vict they're victims of their own success in much of this. Uh, so what I wanted to do is start out by answering a bunch of questions which was why uh, did MDA transform from a pure R&D organization into a full-scale acquisition organization back in 2002? And the answer to that was the Ballistic Missile Defense Organization had been pure R&D, and they had been in this R&D loop, uh, and they were not being able to deliver any capabilities to the warfighter. There were a lot of reasons for that, one of the biggest ones being the ABM Treaty of 1972 that were preventing them from doing that, which we withdrew from uh, in 2002. Uh, and also another factor was the maturity of the technology. We began to see real capability emerge from a lot of this research and development. We began to see successful testing. We saw at GMD three of five successes in Aegis. Uh, um, they had uh, three of three successes in their test flights of SM3. Uh, we also saw an urgency from a threat perspective. Uh, the Tapered on one was launched in 1998, which uh, surprised a lot of the intelligence community uh, of having the North Koreans being able to launch a multi-stage uh, rocket. Uh, the Iranians were building more and more capabilities. They were looking at solid rocket propellant, uh, building a Saphir space launch vehicle, which they have flown successfully since then. And so all of these came, factors came together for a realization that we had to get serious about providing some defense against these weapons. Now, there were special authorities that were given to MDA as referenced uh, in Tom's report throughout. Why, why were, uh, what, what were these special authorities that were given? Well, the first one was there was streamlined oversight with exemption from the DOD 5000 series. Now, that meant that NMDA did not have to participate in the OIPT or overarching integrated product team and the working integrated product team processes within the Pentagon. Um, I personally, having lived through that in my previous life, when I was working uh, Predator and Global Hawk and others on the air staff, I thank God for that. Um, and also, we set up a very streamlined oversight process. Initially, there was a secretary's executive committee. Many people don't realize this. They were consist of the service secretaries themselves, the principals, and they provided direct oversight to the agency in the early 2002, 2003 timeframe, 2004. We set up, subsequent to that, a missile defense executive board that consisted of just the principals in the OSD, and, and that's all who could attend because we wanted a hard-hitting decision-making body that could make decisions, and we did not have a lot of the bouncing around that you had in the previous, uh, some of the previous working groups. It was also exempted from the JSITS process, or the requirements process, and Secretary Rumsfeld exempted the uh, Missile Defense Agency from the operational requirements document, or ORGE process. Why on earth would you do that? Well, at the time, it was taking about 444 days to get an ORD approved through the JROC, okay, over a year. And then if you had to make changes to that, to go back through that whole process was very painful. And it wasn't that they wanted MDA to walk away from the requirements, they wanted them to engage with the warfighter and better understand in an interaction, in a dialogue, in a discussion, as opposed to trying to talk to each other through paperwork through the JROC. Also empowered program management. <clears throat> if you stop and think about it, there's three major processes within the Pentagon uh, that are employed to produce capability. The first is a requirements process that gets approved and trades made. The second is an acquisition process where you get milestone approval for different phases of acquisition. And the third is a budget process that supports all of that. And for every major program just about in the department, the authorities in those three chains don't come together until you're at the depth sec depth level in the department. That can be very, very cumbersome in terms of getting decisions done and getting progress made. So what was empowered with MDA is the director of MDA had the ability to trade requirements, they had the ability to uh, make milestone decisions, and they had the ability to approve budgets and, and, and to transfer resources. That accelerated dramatically the ability to get capability out of the door. Also, it was envisioned when we stood up MDA that we would have a stabilized top line budget and that we would not come back, come back asking for more money every year uh, it would be limited, and the, the goal was about $10 billion a year was, was the budget, and they had to manage within that. Now, as you've heard, that has eroded dramatically over time, but that was the initial going-in proposition was that we would have the $10 billion, 
uh, and that we would able, be able to, to, to make trades in there. And also, it was a single color of money. It was defense-wide RDT&E, which allowed tremendous flexibility to be able to move resources around to various challenges. By the way, we do this in the other programs. We've done it historically. Whenever we've had unprecedented capabilities or urgent programs and we had to get something out the door, we took these very same steps. If you go back to the National Reconnaissance Officers programs in the 1960s and 70s, they had the very same authorities, the ability to move money and to apply resources as needed to meet emerging challenges. And I would, people are looking always for the nirvana of acquisition reform. I would say we need to start looking there in terms of how we can face a very different and changing future. Um, and also there was contracting flexibility. We were able to use uh, contract vehicles such as OTAs and other vehicles that had a lot more flexibility in them than our classic, uh, the classic uh, DOD contracts. Now, why was NBA given these special authorities? Um, well, I mentioned that whenever you had an unprecedented capability, that was one of the things that, that was a trigger for this. But you have to realize that the entire Pentagon is structured around making sure that the capabilities that we get out to the warfighter are as good as what the warfighter has. So the question that's asked throughout the entire process is, why should we feel this capability? It's asked all the time, justify your program. When you have no defense against a threat like we had in 2002, none, we had no defense against what was emerging from these countries. The question needs to be turned around and say, why shouldn't we feel this capability? And that changes a lot of the answers that you get to the questions that you ask in that process. We also needed the ability to move quickly and with flexibility. And I'll give you an example. The Patriot under the Army uh, they had listed five key performance parameters uh, that they could only meet three of. Now, based on the rules, they could not move beyond low rate initial production. They could not be fielded. That was it. But it turned out that those two key performance parameters had nothing to do with the immediate threat and were threats that were far into the future. So when it transitioned to MDA, I called the, the Army Two Star, Stan Green, and said, Stan, can you accept the, this weapon system the way it is? He said, absolutely. It's an order of magnitude better than what I have in the field. So we were able to get it out the door, get it into, uh, into the field in time for Iraqi freedom. So those are the kind of things that, um, that that ability to move quickly within a system is desperately needed. Um, also, threat developments. Um, um, you know, we, we knew even starting the deployments in 2004 that we were in a race with respect to the North Koreans' development of their Tapo Dong 2 rocket. And we ended up having to accelerate deployment of the TPY-2 radar to Japan by a year in order to even make that, that timeline. And so those are the kind of flexibilities that you need in this modern world, because I'm afraid, and I think we're going to need those even more going forward. And then unexpected threats and unexpected challenges. In 2008, uh, we shot down a satellite, uh, our own satellite, because it was presenting a threat, uncontrolled reentry back into the atmosphere and, and p potential uh, casualties when it hit the ground. Uh, we were able to respond to that in eight weeks, from the first phone call I got from the National Reconnaissance Office, office uh, Director to uh, when we actually shot it down was eight weeks. And uh, Hoss Cartwright at the time, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that MDA was the only agency in the entire DOD that could have done that and responded in that time frame. Now, why did MDA operate with a single color of money? Well, it provided us the ability, as I said, to move money and to, and to uh, address resources quickly and flexibility. I'll give you an example. Uh, back in 2006 timeframe, we had suffered a couple of failures, and I needed to move uh, uh, interceptors that were destined for deployment back into a test program. If I had had done that with different colors of money in procurement and RDT, &E, I would have had to gone back to the Hill and go through the entire approval co uh, process for four different committees to get that done. And that would have taken at least weeks, if not months. And that we were able to do it in a matter of days and, and be able to, to begin to address the, the uh, problems that we needed to face. Um, did MDA foresee this R&D budget squeeze that is coming about from procurement operations, maintenance, and construction? And the answer is yes. That's why the initial construct was that after low rate initial production, these assets would be transferred to the services so that MDA could maintain their focus on R&D uh, through early development and early deployment and then get that over to the services for that. Uh, but several complications arose. Uh, the first was we did not fully appreciate, really, at the beginning, the power of integration and of being able to integrate these sensors and interceptors and all the components together. 
So that presented a problem. If you start transitioning, make sure how do you maintain the ability to keep the integration of all these components and elements. Second, there was frankly some concern over the service redirection of money, and they told us that. They had conversations with my boss, General Kadish, and with me, and the services would tell us if, if this is transferred, we're actually going to take the money and apply it to a different mission area because it was not high on their list of, of priorities. It wasn't a core competency yet of that service. And we had to fight that. Uh, that was one thing that we did not foresee, frankly. Um, and then third, the budget reductions that, that, we, that we saw. We had one, we took a big one in 2006. About a billion dollars was taken out. Uh, and then we restored that. And then, of course, we've seen the erosion over time to where we're now about 20% uh, reduction from the top line in 2008. Now, <clears throat> why is this budget squeeze in R&D &D a problem, frankly? Well, one thing we have to realize is what we're talking about is not today. We're talking about the future. We're talking about our ability to viably affect these threats in the future. The same way that today, the reason, the only reason we have defenses against these weapons is because the investments made previously in previous decades. And I'll give you just quick, three quick examples. In 1985, SDIO began the lightweight exoatmospheric exo projectile or LEAP program that was pioneering a small and miniaturized uh, kill vehicles. In June of 91, they successfully completed free hover tests at Edwards Air Force Base. Today, we know LEAP by another name. It is the kill vehicle for the sea-based SM-3 interceptor that's deployed on that's deployed hundreds of interceptors on dozens of ships around the world. SDIO was also developing a hit-to-kill technology and a small agile radar homing vehicle under the flexible, lightweight, agile guided experiment or FLAGE as part of their theater missile defense effort. In 1987, a FLAGE interceptor uh, intercepted a Lance target missile at White Sands Range. It was a solid propellant version of this interceptor that was later chosen by BMDO to become what you know today as the Patriot Advanced Capability, or PAC-3. And finally, another precursor of today's capabilities was the Exoatmospheric Reentry Vehicle Interceptor Subsystem, or ARIS program, which began in 1985 with two tests in the early 90s. The technology from this effort was later used in both the THAAD as well as the GMD program. So what we're talking about is what do we invest today to ensure that we have capabilities tomorrow? And that's something that we can't lose track of. And finally, where do we go from here? Um, I believe that this R&D, and, 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 and General Knudsen mentioned several of the programs that, that, that the MDA has that I think are critical for the future. Uh, even if we're only talking about North Korea and Iran, we have to invest in this R&D to keep up with that quote unquote limited threat because those threats are evolving and they're becoming more mature. We're going to have to be, de and, and then of course if we're talking about a very aggressive China or, more, uh, or a belligerent Russia, we've got a long way to go to, to address that as well. We have, to, we have to be able to overcome things like advanced countermeasures, maneuvering warheads, hypersonic vehicles, and much more. Now, Tom laid out in his report three possible paths ahead. Uh, I believe that there's only really two. I think number three, is too risky. I don't think we can muddle through this. I think status quo is not an answer here. So I think we really do need to tackle this head on for either number one or number two. And what I would actually recommend is a combination of those two. I do believe that MDA's top line should be increased. I believe that a stable $10 billion a year, which was originally envisioned back in 2002, it should be, re should be re uh, restored. And I think you're only talking 1.7% of today's $583 trillion or, or uh, a billion dollar defense budget anyway. I think that we need to maintain MDA special authorities and return to a single color of money for, fle for the flexibility that you need to deal with these emerging threats and to deal with the technology uh, changes that we see. I believe that MDA should retain development authorities such as sustaining engineering modifications so that we don't lose the integration ability of these elements uh, 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 for as we transition them after full-scale production to the services. And I do believe that procurement OMM could be picked up by the services. I think it needs to be handled and transitioned the way that General Knudsen outlined. I think maybe we could get by with less than seven years. I think even giving a, a three to four year heads up would be enough. H establishing hybrid program offices where we could facilitate the transition from MDA to the services would help. And identifying those service personnel uh, early to do that. And as a, as a check and balance, if the monies that are transferred initially to the services or services program for that, if that's intended to be, if they try to reprogram it out of those lines, it has to have MDA and congressional approval to do that. So I think there's a way ahead that we could actually do this. 
Um, in conclusion, I would just say that many have aggressively pushed for MDA to look like every other program in the department. I had a reporter ask me that one time when I was director. And I asked him, would you please tell me which major program in the DOD would you like me to emulate? And he couldn't. I think it's time for us to think about new ways of doing business, using some of the things that we've seen MDA and others do for these, these special authorities. And I think it's time that as we enter a much more dangerous world that we've had in the past, we have the flexibility within our Department of Defense to react to these threats as we need to. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's always true that you know the department is getting serious about something if they start ex accepting it from the uh, usual acquisition process. Yeah. Um, okay. So with that, I want to open it up to questions from the audience. I already see hands going up. You know, and I had questions listed here, but I think there are going to be plenty from you guys. So why don't we start over here, Tony? And please wait for a microphone uh, to come around to you. Morning, uh, Tony Bertuka, Inside Defense. I wanted to drill down on the part of the report about Israeli aid. General, do you, do you concur with the, the finding uh, about Israeli aid that it's, it is squeezing your budget and that unless something's done, Israeli missile defense dollars and U.S. missile defense dollars are going to compete against each other? Do you think the money should be moved to the FMF account? So the facts are as they are on the chart, the Israeli aid is the amount it is. And um, so from percentages, and, and typically if you go look, we'll request a certain amount and then it gets increased um, through congressional action. So it's a challenge that we um, don't have a, an absolute way to predict how it's going to turn out as, in each cycle. Um, but I think the, the counter side of that is that if you go look at the threats that Israel is facing and the advances in capability that ha they have already made and that they uh, believe they need to make in the future, and we're helping them do that, it's a, it's a very uh, extreme situation that they face. <coughs> And they've had more missile attacks, I, I'm certain, than anyone else. So they they feel it. So we are very supportive of doing everything we can to advance their capabilities from from MDA, and and you can see that the Congress is too. And so I'll just say it's a challenge that we have to deal with um, each each and every year. And and as far as should it go to FMF, that's that's a discussion that's happening at higher levels in the department. That it, I it isn't happening. Well, I, I think having stability would be better for MDA. And so however that stability comes about, whether it's some increased amount that everybody knows about, whether it comes out of some other different account, I think stability would be the thing that really would make a degree of benefit to how we, how we work through this. At the end of the day, it, it does come down to, all right, it's, it's the same amount of dollars, and, and what, a, what account it is, it, it sort of is the same. I mean, it's up for it to give us more stability and may give others more stability. Can I just jump in here real quick, which is I think that there, there's nothing here that suggests that we ought to be doing less for our allies in Israel. We're also helping NATO quite a bit at U.S. taxpayer uh, expense. The important thing is, is really in the appropriations process to make sure that, that U.S. programs don't serve as the bill payer at the margin. And if moving it to a different committee, a different account is a way to get at that, uh, that's a possibility. But the, the important thing is it's stability for planning, but, but especially it's not MDA's fault. These trades are not being made <coughs> within MDA. They're being made on Capitol Hill. All right, I saw another hand up over here. Uh, Jim Kiesling, I'm speaking as a private citizen on leave today. Um, since the issue that you bring up is financial flexibility as being the critical issue for program execution, uh, given that the strain is the overseas supported assets, specifically the overseas tippies and uh, the THAAD battery on Guam, why is that not a perfect definition of overseas contingency operations? And uh, 
address the flexibility issue directly. Well, I'll, I'll just say the way we've been programming the support for them is an ONS in the in the main budget, not as OCO. And so, could could decisions be made to categorize it otherwise? Probably, but that's not how we've been doing it. I'm not really going to be able to explain it. You know why it couldn't be? Because it it probably could be, but it isn't. And so that's what we we work within the rules that we have. And I I would add to that that you know, <coughs> OCO funding uh, it, it it is whatever Congress says it is uh, and appropriates as OCO. Uh, but traditionally, uh, you know what is. OCO funding is emergency supplemental funding. The intent of that process in Congress, in appropriations, is to be able to fund things that could not be anticipated when the main budget was being built. That was the intent. It has not been used that way in quite some time. Uh, so we shouldn't kid ourselves anymore. But can I just can I add to that real quick? That in fact, I think it was the House Appropriators this year. They did put some of this stuff in OCO. It's kind of, you know, it's part of the Hask's gambit to, to throw stuff into OCO that didn't look like it. Actually, I think RDT&E in some cases, and possibly even directed energy RDT&E, is thrown into OCO. Um, I think it's neither here nor there. Back like there in the back. Hi, uh, James Drew from Aviation Week. Um, is there a concern about... Uh, from the panel about the uh, micromanagement of, of uh, budget submissions by lawmakers on Capitol Hill uh, when they start, you know, shifting money to Israel and and slicing and dicing things how they want as opposed to what the long-term plans suggest it, sh it should be done? I, I, I would say that the uh, oversight that we see from the Hill is obviously what they deem is necessary. And so if we would try to maintain as much flexibility as we can in, in both color of money and I'll call it the lines within those color of money as General Obering talked about, that gives you some ability to react to things that you didn't foresee as you put in the budget. but. Um, we're responsive to what I'll call the um, the needs for oversight that the Hill has has put on, and 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 as you go look from the time that General Obering was talking about when it was probably more like one line with one color of money, we have many lines now with many colors of money and and lines within those colors of money, and and that's where we are and so what our challenge within MDA is is to be able to predict as best we can of what we're going to need and then and then be able to execute within that and and I think we've done a, a pretty good job of that um, overall I, I would just add that you know uh, a lot of this is is just the interaction and the communications okay uh, Obviously, if we could get one program element line and have all of that in there so we can make the trades, that would be the ideal, but that's not going to happen. Uh, and it didn't happen even in, in our timeline. But to get a reasonable number and then the open channels and the communications and, and let, the, let the Hill know what's going on, let them understand the challenges you face and, and making sure that they're aware of up to speed because reasonable people normally can come to uh, uh, the same conclusion given the, all this, the right information. And I think that's what's more important is that communication and talking uh, and that interaction with the Hill and the staffers as well. I would just say on that point that go and look at the actual muscle movements and the sublines between the, the four committees, the authorizing committees and the appropriations committee this year. There's a lot of continuity there. The, the communication side, I think, is especially constant with the authorizing committees. Um, the slicing and dicing on the directed energy and the uh, MOKV and things like that, there's more slicing and dicing going on on the appropriation side. Uh, that I think is probably unfortunate. All right. right here. Hi, uh, Richard Fieldhouse, and I am a uh, former congressional staffer who did an awful lot of the work on all these uh, issues in terms of oversight and uh, communication with MDA and DOD on 
everything that uh, Tom has presented in the report, so I have scars and painful memories uh, to prove it. Um, and I want to just uh, throw a few observations out um, uh, to, to add a little context to the discussion. Uh, one, on the color of money issue, um, that was one where Congress decided affirmatively that the MDA budget was not appropriately structured with just R&D money. That clearly MDA was doing an awful lot of things at the time, I think Tom alluded to this, that were absolutely not R&D. They were procurement. They were fielding. There was military construction. There was a lot of work going on that was by no means uh, uh, R&D. And Congress wanted the additional oversight and the additional insight uh, by having the colors of money that other agencies, other components of DOD use. So that was not an accidental decision. That was Congress having a very long debate, a very, very deep discussion with MDA on its budget functions and saying, we, the Congress, who authorize and appropriate your funds and make the actual budget decisions every year, we want the additional colors of money so we have the insight to do our oversight. Number one. Uh, number two, uh, the perspective we would typically have on the Hill, and um, I don't think this has really changed much because budget reality has continued to be uh, very uh, tough with the budget caps, BCA, uh, you know, we all know the, the problems, and they affect the entire department, not just MDA. The, the essential viewpoint was, if you want to kill a missile defense program, transfer it to a service, because there is no way a service is going to carry the same priority that the Missile Defense Agency does, and they don't have the money, and if you just transfer stuff to a service, expect it to take on very hard <laughs> times. Um, uh, and, and the sort of notion of constant funding levels, uh, I just don't think that meets the reality test on the Hill and the budget environment. Um, and the, in terms of the, the traditional R&D focus of, of MDA, that was traditional when MDA was first getting started for the reasons that General Obring mentioned and Tom alluded to this. There was nothing to deploy. There was nothing to do um, other than the R&D. So I know this is a, a, long, a long comment. I get to the question I, I here. I get to the question. <laughs> so the question, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to chew up too much time. The question is, Tom, you've laid out three possible options, possible paths ahead, and the last one is sort of increased risk and muddling through. It seems to me the reality of the budget situation, the structure of DOD, the, all of these things, uh, pose the question, is, is not another option increased risk management where you try to keep the balance between, con I mean, there's, look, there's no question. Admiral Searing has made very clear the highest priority we have right now is improving the GMD system. You know, getting it to work as well as we can, improving reliability, maintainability, availability, all those things. That's a, a near-term focus for long-term capability. To do a risk management where you keep the balance between current procurement, fielding, ONS, um, construction, all those things, and the R&D that's necessary for the future, because that's sort of not one of the options, but I think the odds are pretty high that's actually where we're going to go. So. Tom, you want to... I think that makes very good sense. You know, obviously, the, these are thrown throw out three widely divergent paths, deliberately, to be you know, exaggerating for the sake of clarity, as it were. Um, I think that, actually, I mean, MDA is going after the kinds of things that you would most want them to go after on the RKV and et cetera. Um, I think that, it really, as General Knudsen was alluding to, they have been faced with a, not an impossible, but a very challenging task Given the lack of budget stability, right, that's a piece of the risk management. A uh, big piece of it is the lack of budget stability year in and year out. They, it, it, there's differences and deltas between what the fight up last year said you were going to get and what you end up getting this year. And so it's not that they're doing the wrong things. It's that I think that at the higher level, and we're very clear about this in the report, it is a zero-sum game in terms of who pays for the interceptors, as it were. That's not going to solve this problem. It can only be solved really by fixing the disconnect between the policy statements that say, we're gonna outpace the threat. This is the kind of threat that always makes the speeches, right? But it's, it, 
it doesn't transfer over when you've got that diminishing top line year in and year out. It's that, so it's that downward gravitational pressure that I think is, dis is disconnected and inconsistent with uh, the policy statements and where the strategic environment is going, right? The next, the next uh, missile defense review uh, is not gonna just be about ballistics either, right? So you kind of put stack that whole problem on top of this is what, what is the next iteration of a missile defense uh, focused organization? Is it gonna be strictly ballistics? Is it going to be some of these other things? SDIO went, went out and cobbled together a lot of things that were going on in the 70s and early 1980s in the services and put them under one roof, right? And we kind of have something similar right now with cruise missile defense and air defense. There, there's lots of stuff going on out there. And you have to ask the question, maybe it's better off in the services. Maybe it's better off. But then there may, may be the question, or do you want to consolidate some of that stuff? Right? Is there a cruise missile defense entity uh, that could uh, share some commonality between Navy and Army, for instance. So, so I think there's, there's several different uh, magnitudes of that. So I actually want to ask a, a question to the panelists uh, and I'll have each of you answer. Um, you know, there are a lot of different competing priorities that MDA has to balance right now. You've got near-term threats uh, of missiles that are already out there. We know they exist. Uh, you've got long-term threats as missile technology proliferates. Uh, you've got theater range missiles, you've got more strategic range missiles that could reach the homeland. If you had one more dollar to spend on missile defense, what would you put it towards? Would you put it towards the R&D and the new technology for future threats, or would you put it towards procurement to buy more of the systems we're fielding today? If you had one more dollar, what would you do with it? Tom? I, I think the, the honest answer, or the, you or want the, or $2, the sharper question not an is, option. the sharper question is which <laughs> line within our DTD would you Okay. I suspect that, that I'm going to guess that, that it'd be somewhere on our DT&E. Okay. And the question is, do you focus it on, you know, uh, the kill vehicle for GMD, the RKV, or do you put focus on discrimination, which I think is typically the answer given, uh, frequently given, uh, by MDA, uh, or do you put it in something like directed energy? Uh, and I think that the path that MDA has been doing is to kind of divide it between the discrimination improvements, the actual kill vehicle reliability, and the directed energy. And so I think probably it's a you, you put 30 cents in each one of those. <laughs> All right. So, so I'll, I'll uh, probably second that, but I'll, I'll tackle it this way. This, that's actually the question I think we um, explicitly within MDA wrestle with, and, and, and to a large degree the rest of the department, uh, each cycle that we go through this. And so we are balancing this very near-term capability, you can call it fight tonight, fight tomorrow from the COCOM demands and, you know, you can go to various regions of the world and see what's stacked up against them and what they may have to fight within a few days if things go up. And so that's, a, that's the real balance that we're, that we're working as well as, you know, what do we do for kind of the intermediate future and then the longer term future. And so, so we're balancing really three, not just two. Um, and and for the a little bit beyond, you know, fight tonight, fight tomorrow is the things that we're doing to improve discrimination. And it is LRDR, it is the other improvements that we're doing to discrimination, and it is improving the reliability of the GMD system that we've put a significant effort in over the, over the last few years, including the RKV and other things. And then, you also have to look at the longer term. And, you know, so the longer term is some of the things that I mentioned before, which is MOKV, which is um, boost phase kill. And, and we do believe that in order to get to where we'll need to be against what we would project as a more, even more robust threat, is that we'll have to have a, a, a ability to get to an affordable state space strategy probably with partners from others in the department in order to have persistent ability to get to both tracking and discrimination from space there are always limits to terrestrial uh, we're seeing those today so we we're wrestling with that exact question where do we put the next dollar where do we put 10 cents of the next dollar and so i, I don't think that one's an easy answer either because that's our that's our challenge and I would echo uh, what was said. I mean, obviously, 
what we have to understand is we are in, we are in a fundamentally different world than, we are, than we've known in the past, a fundamentally different world. We, we, we talked in the past about near peer. We have peer competitors now. We have a much, a much more dangerous world we're entering into. And what I'm trying to say, and, what I'll, and I'll get to your question exactly, is what do we need to do differently now to prepare for that? Okay, I think as General Newton said, and as Tom said, um, this, you, you want to look for when you say where do I need to place my, my next dollar? It is where do you get the biggest bang for that buck? Where can you get the most return for that? Okay, across the board, discrimination across the board helps everything. It helps it helps in your shot doctrine. It helps in your interceptor uh, inventory, etc. Space is a key part of that. Is a critical part of that. Uh, having a space-based capability initially as a sensing capability, and eventually maybe an intercept capability, would do, go a long way to addressing some of the, th the threats that we see as we're, we're, that we're going to be faced with. And, and, and Richard, I was glad to hear from you. Richard is a recovering staffer from the Hill. He and I had many arguments on some of these subjects. <laughs> My only point that I would tell you is that I think that the experiment that was MDA from 2002 to the present I think we could learn from that. And I think that there's some flexibilities that we're given. Sure, there were things that were done. It's how you interpret it. But the flexibilities are what we need to pay attention to. And, and, and I think it's not against the oversight. I think that those are the kind of things is, number one, what do we fundamentally be, need to be doing differently? We can't rely on a 1971, 1971 acquisition process built for the Cold War and a funding process that was made years and years and decades ago, we cannot necessarily rely on that to keep us competitive and safe in the future. So we need to be making some fundamental looks at what we're doing, how we're doing business, and what should we be placing our bets on for the future? Because if we keep going through the way we are now, uh, we're gonna have a whole different conversation in another 10 years. All right, question here. Hi. <laughs> My name is Richard Bleach. I'm retired MDA, thanks to General Obering. But you're making me feel old now. <laughs> so what I wanted to mention, and it leads up to a question, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, but this isn't the main point, about why you use the total uh, obligation authority rather than the appropriations. Because for the first 20 years of the program that I was involved in, we used uh, the appropriations for the, for, for the planning, for the programming, for the budgeting, as well as the metric for the execution, because it told us how much we could get done. But regardless of that, the curves may be similar. But I think what um, I wanted to mention is, and Richard mentioned it too, is the way we, way we handled every, especially the first few years, the 25% a year budget reduction that we got in the appropriation was to always have a second plan in our back pocket. <laughs> and when that plan came out, of course, there was a lot of politics, and maybe this still goes on today, but that set at least a baseline for talking about how we would do the program with a 25% budget cut. And at the end, and what I learned after three cycles, was we got about the same amount of work done. So the risk management or the efficiency approach, particularly the one that Ash Carter started when he was, came back into ATNL, I think is a reasonable thing you know, to keep working on and keep pressing on because history, at least in this program, shows that it works. Second thing with Israel. We started with Israel when Secretary Weinberg wanted to invite our allies in 1985. So I went over there in 1985 and ever since 1985, and I have a chart I can show you, for the next 10 years, we spent about, I don't know if it was 1%, or, but it was about the same percentage, maybe even more. We spent about $500, $600 million with Israel out of the MDA budget. I'll show you the chart for all, all the allies. And that was not just uh, through our contracts, but mainly with the service contracts. So um, there is a way of dealing with Israel without saying whether you have too much or too little, but I think working through the services, through our executing agent, was the way we handled it before. Finally, the last and most important thing, and, and maybe this is the question, 
I see another uh, path because of what I learned 30, 40 years ago now, not only through MDA, but even when the ballistic missile, not the missile defense system was. And that is, as you know, President Reagan, the White House, Secretary Weinberger was the, uh, the boss in terms of the missile defense program. In other words, SDIO reported directly to the Secretary of Defense. When we had a problem, we were over there several times a year meeting with the president and trying to get things done. So you can see where this is leading to. The same that I learned from one of my mentors, uh, General Bernie Schriever, when he built ballistic, uh, ballistic missiles. He had to work through the White House. Ash Carter now understands that well. I've talked to him you know, for 30 some odd years right now. When the leadership and the top leadership gets involved, that to me is one way where we got SDIO started, where General Overing knows because his boss went down to Texas there and you know, was told what to do. I think from a practical standpoint that you have a good report, but that kind of thing should be explored again too because it's worked in the past. So I'm sorry if I didn't let, answer let me, question. Let me, let me jump on that um, real quick. Uh, we thought it was important not to look at the appropriations numbers that were initially enacted by, Con that were initially enacted by Congress, but to actually look what they was spent. Uh, because uh, for instance, one year, uh, I think GMD took a $100 million cut after appropriations to what uh, the rescission that was made. So little things like that are, are kind of important uh, over the, the long haul. Second, if there's, uh, as I, I think I mentioned before, if these look different than MDA charts you've seen, it's because we've inflated the dollars, which I think is actually more, more accurate, uh, less potentially misleading in terms of where, where the, the constancy is. Usually these are given in then year dollars. In terms of Israel, you know, wh wherever the money comes from, it's, it's still taxpayer money. Uh, I think that's neither here nor there. In high-level leadership, uh, that's exactly what we say in the report, is that unless you capture the imagination of the king, uh, you know, uh, unless we fix that disconnect between the policy priority and, and the numbers that we're putting to this, uh, this, this will never get fixed. This will just keep going down, down, down. Yeah, a question back here. <clears throat> Yes, uh, thank you for sharing your expertise today with us, everyone. And uh, just wanted to run by you, there's current statutory language that requires the director of the MDA to be a three-star general or uh, vice admiral or higher. Um, there's a Senate provision right now in the NDA that would remove that requirement. And I'm just wondering, as far as a lot of these uh, challenges you're discussing here today, how would having, say, a two-star or one-star at the MDA affect some of those challenges rather than a three-star? Let General Overy let, take that let me, let me address that, because <clears throat> I actually was a signatory to a letter addressing that to the Senate, uh, along with uh, all of the former directors of the Missile Defense Agency, except for General Abe, who was uh, not available, uh, along with uh, former NORTHCOM commander, retired four-star, uh, former retired PACOM commander, four-star. Um, we had uh, two other four-stars and two other three-stars. Now, I think that would be a very bad bad thing to do. And the reason is because of a couple of things. Number one, the scale and scope of the agency and the scale and scope of the programs is such that you really do need to have a three or four star in charge of that. The, just the breadth of the programs th themselves, you have at least 10, 10 major uh, ACAT-1 programs within the agency at any given time, and the scale and scope of that warrants that level of, of oversight. Uh, the second piece is, an awful lot of international interaction with uh, allies at a very senior levels. Uh, I briefed the NATO Council almost 20 times. I briefed the NATO Russia Council about 10 times. Um, and so having those types, uh, uh, having that interaction at those senior levels with the ambassadors, et cetera, again, I think warrants that type of, of that level. And the third reason, I think it would send a terrible message to our adversaries uh, that we don't value missile defense like we used to. And I think that be for those reasons, as, and that's why my fellow signatories joined me in that letter, uh, I think it should remain, a, a, if it's a military position, a minimum of three or four star. All right. So final question here. So uh, at the end of the, uh, Ken Tartaroff, by the way, at the end of the report, Tom uh, talks about a new BMDR, and we're going to elect a new president in just over 100 days. There will be a new administration, obviously. That next administration will likely tackle a new BMDR, Ballistic Missile Defense Review. 
There's a lot of speculation and chatter right now on removing the word limited from the current BMDR, which really would, I mean, the subtitle of your report is more responsibility. So I'm going to give General Knutson a pass on this question because he's, he's currently serving. He shouldn't, shouldn't be obligated to answer it. But for the rest of you, what would that do, taking out the word limited? Would that be, you know, talk about more responsibility? Would that put additional strain on this budget squeeze and the color of money? What would be the implications of that? Gee, thanks. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank Ken. Uh, he's been a great sounding board. And, uh, you know, one of, these, one of these bullets on here, uh, uh, he wrote a very fine uh, paper on the back to basics part, which I commend to you. Uh, you know, on the limited side, I think it's important to stay focused on what we're trying to accomplish. I would, I would ask the, the question, what is the thing that we want to do that we can't do with the word limited in place? Because when that was written as a compromise uh, back in 1999, uh, it had in mind a different definition of the word limited than we have today. We were a little bit closer to the, the former Soviet Union at that point, and folks were still thinking about a rogue Soviet, ex-Soviet commander, a rogue uh, SLBM launch. So the history of that going back through the 1990s presupposed a limited Russian strike. Uh, and furthermore, uh, look, g pals is limited. Everything is, is finite. So, uh, you know, I think it... Uh, Folks in Congress uh, had their reasons for doing that. Uh, I think that really distracts from the real issue. The real issue is if you want it to be less limited, put some more money into it. Uh, that's the way to make it less limited. If you want to do, go do a different program, a space layer for sensors, okay, go do that. There is nothing that I know of that is legislatively prohibited by that 1999 National Missile Defense Act. Others like to comment? Okay, thanks, Ken. Um, I, I will say this, and I agree with what Tom said. However, we don't always get a vote in this, right? Uh, SDIO was stood up not to address a limited threat. It was to address an existential threat to the United States. Uh, I think it is worthy of debate to discuss whether we take that, that term out or not. Uh, for a lot of reasons, the limited was there because that's all we could do. Uh, and I know that that's, that was one way of moving forward from a political compromise to begin to be able to field capabilities. Uh, if limited is getting in the way of us addressing threats like a hypersonic glide vehicle, take it out. If it's not, leave it in. But I think that that has to be, you know, we, we're not the only ones who are getting a vote here. We, ha we have been charged, at least the General Newsom still, but with protecting the American people, our allies and our forces. We need to do whatever is necessary to do that. And if we have policy that's getting in the way of that, change the policy. If we have acquisition models that are getting in the way of that, change the acquisition models. If we are having funding models that are getting away with that, change the funding models. Our primary mission is protect the people of the United States, our allies and forces. That we always ought to keep that in mind. Everything should flow from that. And if we can do that with a limited staying in there, Fine. If we can't, get rid of it. And, and so before we close, we haven't talked yet about the cyber dimension of all of this and the cyber threats that affect missile defense. Uh, and so, General Obrey, I, I know you have some thoughts on this. I, I do. Uh, okay, so this gets back to, again to the threat. Um, I, I've looked at this, and now I was part of a, another uh, study that kind of looked at, at threats around the world and what's emerging. Uh, I believe that, in the, if I focus on China here for a second, I think what China's doing is very deliberate. I think that they looked at what happened in the first Gulf War, and it surprised them, the U.S. capabilities. And I think that they decided at that point that they had to do something about that. And I think they, they looked across the spectrum. So the fact that they're going after, and if you think about what has been our advantage since World War II for the United States, the first one, has, is our ability for strategic reconnaissance. We knew what was going on. We knew what was happening in the Berlin crisis. We knew what was happening during the Cuban crisis because we had overhead assets to do that. So what are they doing? They're developing ASAT capabilities to be able to target those. What's the next major advantage we had? Our ability to project power globally. And one of the key components of that is what? Our carrier battle groups and to be able to do that. So they're developing a DF-21 DF missile to be able to go after that. 
And the third piece of it is our overwhelming technological advantage that we had, especially over the Soviet Union. Okay, and they're going after that from a cyber attack perspective. Uh, a lot of what we see are direct derivatives of their attacks on our systems and a lot of what they're pulling out. So we've got to stop that. We've got to be able to stop that, that, uh, that leakage in terms of cyber uh, sensitivity and cyber security for our systems to enhance and enable whatever we do going forward in missile defense. All right. And their final thoughts? All right. Well, I want to thank you all for attending today. Uh, and please join me in giving uh, the panelists a, a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.